All right, welcome everybody to our 37th UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup. And uh, it's great to see all of you here today. And so let's jump right in. We've got a, a super great guest, but we'll get to her in a moment. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Emily. And a big shout out and thank you to Emily, uh, who is one of our product strategy interns in the CTO office. And she uh, helps us organize and keep on track with all of this. Uh, so welcome and thank you to our planners, uh, the planner group and our sponsors in Berkeley IT, Citrus and the Banatow Institute, and uh, the Division of, Division of Computing, Data Science and Society, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Research IT, and of course, Skydeck, which is where we used to have our in-person meetings. Uh, so it takes a, a village to put this thing together and keep it interesting. Um, and then this is just, we do not clearly have um, announcements, but if anyone has an announcement, something you'd like to share, um, please speak up and let us know. Raise your hand or you can put stuff in the chat. Sure. Greg, I have a ahead. couple of links to put in the chat. Uh, in October, there are a couple of different um, Microsoft events, which include Azure components. One is their, their, their sort of general um, conference called Ignite. Uh, which has a lot of Azure stuff. And the other is um, uh, Microsoft Research Summit. And those are free to re register and include uh, online participation. So Thank let you. me just give a quick introduction, introduction to Carrie. Uh, she's the Executive Director of Infrastructure Services at the University of California Office of the President. That's the sort of overall office that runs a lot of the administration for all of our campuses and across the University of California. She's responsible for UC-wide infrastructure uh, that support all the campuses, um, as well as the local IT stuff that is in UCOP. Uh, she's doing cloud on-premises systems, uh, leads groups that do system administration, database administration, applications, service management, vendor management, network engineering, and all their 24-7 operations support. She is a certified uh, AWS education champion uh, she's migrated enterprise workloads at a bunch of different institutions. In fact, we had her at the meetup, and we'll share the link from her past talk when she was at the <laughs> Santa Cruz. Um, and she's the co-chair of Educause's cloud computing uh, community group with over 1,500 members. And before UCOP, she was at UC Santa Cruz, University of Arizona, and Harvard. And so without further ado, she has done more with the cloud than probably any other individual in the University of California. I think that's not an unrealistic claim, Carrie. And so we're really glad to have you back here at the meetup. Thank you. I, I think that's a little strong, but, but I enjoy working in the cloud and have done a fair amount that I'm proud of. So. You've seen the silver lining and the dark side. I have. Um, so Emily, I guess let's drop our slide and let Carrie project. All right. Can you see those slides? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so Bill did an excellent introduction, so thank you for that, Bill. Um, so just kind of to cover, my responsibilities um, are really around cloud transformation at University of California Office of the President, um, as well as strategic planning. And part of that for me is really making sure that I build great teams. Um, without great teams, I can't do anything. Um, so I consider that a very important part of my job. Um, other than that, I think Bill... All right, so I was asked to speak about the recent cloud adventures at UCOP. Um, so we have done cloud migrations three different ways over the past couple of years. Um, I wish there was a magic solution where all the migrations could be done one way and it worked perfectly every time. That has not been my experience. Um, so I wanted to share some of the recent migrations that we've done. Uh, we did move our payroll system. Um, so to answer the question at the beginning, we process 1.5 billion in payroll monthly. Um, covering about 250,000 employees in our payroll system, which is called UC Power. Uh, back in late, 29, no, late 2020, uh, we had to migrate UC Path off of its existing platform, new platform and to AW, or to a new MSP and to AWS. Um, that effort was done in six months. 
Um, we had to leverage an MSP for that because we did not have the capacity and we didn't, we weren't as mature in our cloud understanding. So that is not something we would have been able to accomplish on our own. Um, moving a large enterprise system with zero tolerance for failure or instability in a six month period is not something that we could have done without help from experts. Um, so we engaged a new MSP and we were able to move that. Um, we did include the UCOP teams um, to make sure that they were involved in the solutions and we were able to do some innovation. So we use infrastructure as code and you know, manage services like RDS where possible, but it is a giant ERP, it's PeopleSoft, HCM. So we weren't able to go through and really make anything through the serverless. So that is one way to migrate uh, to the cloud, a managed service provider. Next effort um, I did was around the UC Berkeley data center. So UC Berkeley graciously uh, hosts our co-location for disaster recovery. And um, they've been doing that for many, many years, um, but it was time for us to refresh our hardware. Uh, I had been struggling to um, make cloud a real priority at UCOP, um, given all the other important projects that were happening. So I needed to find an effort for migration that I could kind of self-contain within my group. Um, of course, any cloud migration really uh, impacts everybody, um, the application team, the business team, but this was something that could be driven primarily within infrastructure. So we were able to kind of do this on the side, I guess is my nice way of saying this. Um, so we decided we were gonna be moving our uh, footprint in the Berkeley Data Center to AWS. About four months it took us to do that. The team uh, did it all internally, it was all OP resources. So we're really proud of that. We didn't try to stress uh, you know, high innovation. We wanted to build confidence with the team, right? This is disaster recovery. So we knew that as long as it worked, it didn't have to be beautiful. So we used Cloud Endure to replicate snapshots. Um, and it worked really well. We were able to get out of that data center, uh, which we appreciate Berkeley providing for us for so long. Um, but we were able to get our footprint established in AWS and prove that we could do it in a safe environment. So the team knew we were building confidence in them um, and the business owners knew that we could, we could actually migrate uh, workloads on our own. That was a big one. So I consider that one a self-managed migration. Next, we had the mainframe migration. So uh, OP had a footprint in the UCLA mainframe. Um, there was a decision to move all of that to AWS. That was a giant project. It took about two years to get through that. There was no way we had capacity to do that given all the other projects that we had going on and our expertise. Um, we really tried to create a solution that would be have the minimal amount of maintenance going forward. Mostly static data, there's some dynamic data, but mostly static data that is referenced often. Um, but we, we didn't need to have, you know, there's not a lot of changes to this data. So we really wanted to make sure that we didn't have to do a lot to keep this infrastructure up. We really wanted to have a simple solution. Um, so the heaviest load for this, besides the professional services that assisted us, was really on the applications team and making sure that those solutions worked um, for them and their customers. So um, that one went over pretty well also. Um, and then most recently, we have a system called Apply UC. This is the student system um, used by high kids who are looking to get into any of the UCs, they have used the system called UC for their application process. Um, in the past couple of years, that system has stumbled a little bit around the open enrollment period. What we find is the last few hours of the enrollment window, you get a crazy number of users trying to get in there and sometimes the system doesn't stay as stable as we need. So for two years now, we've hit some bumps, um, different degrees of bumps, but we've hit some bumps. And so we needed to look and think different. We, we weren't gonna try to keep Apply UC on premise. There just aren't enough dials for us to turn. Um, so we, as part of the Berkeley data center migration, uh, one of the workloads that we moved disaster recover for was Apply UC. In doing so, we were able to go to the application owners and the business owners and show them that Apply UC was already working in the cloud in a disaster recovery environment. Doing so brought them a lot of confidence that it would also work for the production environment. So in a three month time period, we were able to move Apply UC um, from an on-premise data center in San Diego to AWS. It was done only by OP resources. Um, we didn't try to have crazy innovation again. We really just had to minimize risk, right? We didn't have time to put anything related to Apply UC to significant change. We just really had to keep things simple and as, as like for like as possible. Um, so it really forced the team to think about teamwork, 
um, and making sure that, you know, we kind of got rid of the barriers. Like I'm applications, your infrastructure, we all just work together to make sure that we could get apply UC to where it needed to be. Um, and the enrollment period starts October 1st, it goes through November 30th. And the last couple of days, we will all be standing by desperately hoping that it, you know, stays stable. Um, in, in AWS, we were able to uh, do some load testing. Previously on premise, we've either done five or 10,000, maybe 20,000 for our load testing. Uh, in AWS, we were able to get the system up to 75,000 concurrent users. So that's a huge change for us. It brings us a lot of confidence with the system. It doesn't mean we won't have some surprise, but I feel like we've done as much as we can to be prepared um, for this enrollment period and hoping that uh, we don't have any additional issues this year. If we do, um, I probably won't be here next year. So <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but the team worked really hard together and it was great to see people understand this is a priority and we needed to get the system up and running in AWS and we did it. Um, so they're really proud of that. And that, that I also consider to self-manage. All right, so upcoming cloud adventures. So we've done, we've done some big things, right? UC Path, Apply UC, those are giant, giant systems serving over 200,000 people each. Um, we've done some things on our own. We did the Berkeley Data Center on our own. Um, and the mainframe, we use professional services. Well, now we have to start looking at Redwood. Redwood is the pension system used uh, for all the UCs. It, it's, it serves about 100,000 retirees. Um, in that system, we need to move away from our existing managed service provider who has it working on Azure. Um, at, universe, at, at OP, we um, don't have faculty or students. Um, so we are able to select a preferred cloud provider and really stick with that provider. So we have chosen AWS. So as part of the effort to take over the hosting for Redwood, we will be putting it on AWS. Uh, we don't have any expertise in Azure. Um, but we are trying to decide right now if we should use a managed service provider or if we should use professional services and then convert it to more of a self-managed mode. And that's still TBD. We don't know what we're going to do, but I think it's going to happen in 2023. That would be my expectation is that we get either all of the migration done or most of the migration done in 2023. So that's a big project. The pension system does essentially serve as a payroll system. Um, so again, we have high requirements on reliability and making sure the system is stable. Next big effort we have going on is around our primary data center, which is located in San Diego. The data center currently has about 150 applications. Our goal is to migrate all of those applications to AWS. The reason we're doing this is because we did a hardware refresh a few years ago and we never want to do one again. Um, so in order to get out of San Diego and move to AWS, we've, we've got to do this big migration project. We're trying to figure out exactly how that's going to happen. Um, we expect, well, we hope to have that migration done by December of 24, um, which now that this is recorded, I'm going to say that's our hope. Um, additionally, the risk we think is relatively low um, associated with this, we have a little bit of wiggle room on the time. Um, and we also have proven that we can, we can do big things and, and we built our confidence. We're not experts. Um, we never will be, but we feel like we have some good uh, cloud skills that we can leverage to make this successful. Um, the culture. So this is an interesting one for our culture. So, you know, there are people who have been working uh, on on-premise infrastructure for decades. And so as part of this move where we're gonna be 100% in the cloud, we have to make sure to get everybody on board, everybody trained up on cloud and everybody comfortable. So that's really how we're gonna be spending a lot of our time over the next couple of years as well. Um, I, we will not be using a managed service provider for this. This just doesn't make sense given all the small applications. So we will be leveraging professional service to help us get there. We just don't have the staff. We can't scale as wide as we would need to to be successful. Um, so we're gonna get some professional services and they're gonna help us um, with this migration, we'll be closely working with them. And, uh, and then we will change those over to self-managed mode as soon as that migration happens. We will be, of course, leveraging infrastructure as code just because that's the easiest way to make any process repeatable. And when I say managed services where possible, for me, that's mostly RDS and some of those other cloud native services um, that just help us get more efficient in the cloud. All right, so teachable moments. I think this is probably where Bill wanted us to spend most of our time. Uh, so one of the things I found is that cloud standards are absolutely critical to success. Also 
not a place anybody really wants to spend their time. Nobody's excited to talk about cloud standards. Nobody wants to like spend time arguing about account structure, but it's so important. If you don't have cloud standards, you really can't scale any of your offerings. You really can't just pick up and support new customers as they come over. Right now, if somebody wants a new AWS account, we're able to turn that around in about an hour. Um, and we have all of these baked in security measures. That's all because we have standards. If we didn't spend time on defining those standards, every time we'd be like, oh, what, what flavor would you like of this? What brand of that? Like we can't do that. So we have to make sure that we really have these standards. Um, it, the standards have helped us internally really divide the, the responsibilities up well. Um, before that, we've had a lot of confusion about who does what in the cloud. Um, different teams were doing different things. So we needed to make sure that we all handle logging the same way and we know whose responsibility logging is. Uh, we also pick specific tools, like we're using Terraform, we're not using CloudFormation. Um, that helps us to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Um, easier maintenance. So as you guys know, any cloud provider provides a frequent number of updates um, on all of the changes to their services that is very hard to stay on top of. So if we have a couple of key services that we're using, it allows us to really focus on those um, maintenance windows, uh, those new, new roadmap items that are coming, all of that really allows us to focus instead of getting distracted. We also have picked just one or two regions. So our primary uh, workloads are in Oregon and our backups are in Virginia. And so this allows us when there's an outage, if there's an outage in Ohio, we immediately know that 99% of the time we don't have to worry about it. However, if there's an outage in Oregon, like there was two days ago, uh, then we know that we immediately have to spend time on it. Um, so even that little change where we pick just a couple of regions to focus on saves our team a lot of time. Um, so I would always recommend something like that as well. Um, we have a lot of focus around cost management. One thing I found in the cloud, which is so different from on-premise, is that the managing your costs and, and really analyzing your costs gives you great insight into your technology. That's not something that happened before on-premise, but it really happens now. I can go in and say there was a spike on Monday. What happened on Monday? And I can go to the specific accounts team, the account owning team and say, what did you do on Monday? And they're floored that I'm able to go back and see that they did something on Monday. I could never do that on premise. I wouldn't have that visibility. And it's really easy um, within the cloud tools that are provided. Um, it also allows us to use uh, a tool, I'll talk more about it in a minute, called Cloud Custodian. And that helps us to make sure that these standards are kept. And if people have a break in these standards, um, most of them are enforced at, or sent a notification that they have broken a standard uh, through a service now ticket and ask them to correct it um, just so that we all stay aligned. It's really easy to drift, not intentionally, but to just not realize there's a standard in place. And so we've got ways to capture that. So cloud standards are absolutely critical to me. And, and you know, I've been at three different universities now doing cloud workloads. And, and this is where I see everybody stumble. If we don't have good cloud standards in place, you will have to pause at some point and put them in place. And then you've got a certain amount of debt that you've got to go back and address. And that nobody wants to spend time on redoing things that are working, um, but you're gonna to have to if you don't have these cloud standards in place before you get started. I wanted to share some of the cloud standards that we put in place at OP. Uh, so account structure, as I mentioned, that's super important. It allows you to think about OUs and how you're gonna We have like a, an OU for production. We have an OU for non-production. We have an OU um, some of our accounts are really pass-through accounts run by other groups. Like um, so we have a couple different OUs that we manage, and that allows us to put security policies around the different OUs appropriately. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about what account owners should and shouldn't do. Uh, that's very important to work out with people so we know who is responsible for what. Account creation, I mentioned that earlier, getting that one hour turnaround to be able to deliver a brand new account with these base offerings included is huge. Making sure you've got standards for backups, you know, cost management, how is that going to handle email management? We have central um, SES, you know, making sure our logs are going to queue radar so our security team can take a look at them. We have to have a network plan, right? Otherwise, we, we, to be honest, we didn't have a great network plan when we started and we are still trying to clean it up. So that is one of the standards that I wish we had started further back in our journey. Patching, security, of course, is critical. Tagging is a good way that you can really um, track spend and track services and tools. And then IAM access and policies. You want to make sure that people have um, the right access that's appropriate for them. So these are some of the standards that we have established at OP over the past couple of years. 
Um, and then the question always comes up, how do you actually maintain those cloud standards, right? So great, Carrie, put in all these rules and tell people they have to do things. We've done that, but how are you gonna actually make sure that they're still doing it? Um, and that's that's been an interesting challenge. We have a tool that we call cloud, that's called Cloud Custodian, it's a free, uh, free tool. And it allows us to identify whenever somebody has not done something according to our policy. So we can set up rules and they're enforced. Um, the rules can do different things. Some are just notify. Uh, sometimes there's a, a, a notification that you're missing a tag. Um, and so that would create a ServiceNow ticket. That ticket gets assigned out to the account owner to clean it up or to the infrastructure team to clean it up depending on what, what it is. Um, we also have some uh, policies that actually do enforcement. So we found a lot of EDS volumes would get orphaned. And so we have a policy that looks for them. And when it finds them, it tags them and says, if I am not tagged differently with a special tag we have that's like, don't delete basically. If I'm not tagged and handled in the next two weeks, I will be deleted. So we have one script that goes through and tags everything and says like kind of pending deletion. And then we inform the right people. And if they don't take action, which usually they don't wanna take action because usually they don't realize it's orphaned, then we have another script that comes through and deletes um, that orphan volume. We have to be very careful with deletes, of course. Uh, we've done a lot of testing around it and we're very comfortable with it, but it can, it can take actions as well as just inform. So that's been really helpful. Um, and by creating those tickets, it's really identifying what cleanup needs to happen. That's been a big win for us. Another thing, another standard, another way that we maintain our standards is by having these monthly account owner meetings. So we have this, um, we'll call him a cloud analyst. He's amazing. He just kind of picks this cloud stuff up on the side, um, but he is running with it. And so this cloud analyst has a monthly meeting with each account owner. We have about 40 accounts, but we really only have about 10 or so unique account owners because many of those people have several accounts each. In that account meeting that they have monthly, um, they will review security, uh, often looking at trusted advisor and the other notices or concerns that we might have for those accounts. Next, they will look at the cost analysis. So as I mentioned earlier, you can really get a lot of information around looking at those trends and understanding uh, why your spend is going up or down. Non-compliance, so that's where we have a uh, discussion around cloud custodian tickets, making sure we know that they need to take action on them or we need to take action on them. Just having that conversation is really important. Um, we also spend a lot of time sharing what the cloud team is doing. So we do have a new kind of team that we've created over the past couple of years. We have one cloud architect and three senior cloud engineers. And so we like to make sure that our cloud analyst goes through and talks about what that team is focused on. Um, giving the business owners and the application owners a heads up on what we're doing will help them be less surprised when it comes to them for some sort of action or when we're doing something in their account. Um, so that's a really important conversation that we have. And then additionally, we try to flip that around and we ask them what they're going to be doing. Um, so we have a lot of workloads. Apply UC is a great example where there's this really large peak enrollment period, right? Between October and the end of November, it's crazy. They have all, like almost all their usage is during that window. The other times of the year, it's really quiet. So we make sure that when the business has some big event coming up and we need to scale, we have that conversation. If they're expecting a major upgrade, we have that conversation. We make sure that these monthly meetings are, are sharing information both ways, right? It's not just us talking at them or us saying, do your tickets, although sometimes I wish it was. Um, but instead, it's us talking as a team and saying, okay, we both are responsible for this cloud workload. What do we need to do to make it smarter? It can influence our savings plan purchases. It can influence um, turning environments on and off at night. It, there's a lot of discussions that happen in those monthly meetings. Uh, so those are really important to have to make sure that we don't kind of set it and forget it, which is sometimes the mindset of those on-premise environments. And in the cloud, everything costs money, right? So you have to make sure that you continue um, to look at it and review it and just kind of forget it because those costs can be a little surprising. All right, next is cloud culture. So this is really important. Um, I believe strongly that the hardest part of any cloud migration is the people. Uh, the, the technology isn't too hard. You can get lots of people to help you. It's not necessarily easy, but it's not, it, it's doable. Um, it's the people that make this really hard. Um, I found, so I've had to set like a cloud vision a couple places now. And I, find, I found that you really have to like through your vision is possible and really build trust between your teams that you're going to do this. Um, so that, that's a 
big part is making sure you set a strategy and say, we're doing this and here's how we're going to get there. Um, just being able to remind the team of what's been done, looking through those first four slides on the significant workloads that have been moved, that's a big win. And I think you have to keep reminding them, you've already done this. You've already moved out of the data center. We can move out of San Diego. We've already done it once. We just need to think about the best way to do it. Um, I think you also need to be really careful with understanding where your staff are in their cloud journey. So sometimes um, you have folks who are really excited to learn new skills. And sometimes you have folks who are very comfortable with the skills that they have, and they're not necessarily looking for change. You've got to find ways to engage both groups, right? You don't want just one group engaged and one group kind of getting ignored. That's not great. Um, so you need to make sure you assess where people are at. And, you know, cloud training is a hard thing. I really found that the most effective kind of training is hands-on. You can send people to these formal, you know, training opportunities and they will gain skills. Um, but unless they're actively using them, they typically get forgotten. Um, so I think it's really important that you assess where your team is at and what you're going to do to get them there, what you're going to do to get them to the maturity that you need them to be successful. I uh, really encourage you learning, telling people it's fine to take time out of their day to actually be learning about the cloud and, and playing around in some of those environments. Uh, we have to talk about confidence, making sure they know that we are, we believe they can do it, right? I know that you guys can move apply UC. I know you can, right? We had a lot of conversations about that. Apply UC wasn't so sure they wanted to be moved, um, is what I will say. What I will say, they're a great group of people, but they just didn't want any change. And I get that. So we really had to make sure the infrastructure folks were really confident about um, that they could do this and, and where we were going. And we put guardrails in place so that we knew they'd be successful. Fail fast and fail often. So this is about learning. If you, if it's a big deal, if somebody makes a mistake in the cloud, then they're going to stop trying. You know, if, if you if you get kind of scolded or, or, or shamed for not making the right decision, then why would you try again? And that's not what the cloud's all about. So you really need to be failing every so often, um, not all the time, but every so often you need to fail because if you're not, are you really trying or are you just doing the easiest path that you already know? So I think that's a little bit about innovation and making it safe for people to try new things. Um, embracing ambiguity, that's, that's a big one just in higher ed in general, um, but you're not going to have all the answers up front. And one thing I've done twice now is I've really deferred the job description changes. So sometimes when you're starting a big cloud project, you're like, you know what I need to do? I need to get these job descriptions figured out. I need to hire people into these roles and they're going to have these really specific skills. That's great if you're totally sure you know where your gaps are. I didn't know where the gaps were. I wanted people to have the chance to grow and shine. And then when I had a position to fill, I wanted to go back and say, what do we actually need on this cloud team? Do we need cloud networking skills or do we have that? Do we need cloud security skills or do we have that? I didn't know because we hadn't put people out there, right? And a lot of people have histories that prior to working at UC that we don't necessarily remember all of their history. Maybe they were a DBA in a past life, but now they're security analysts. Great, let's give them a chance to shine and, and try new cloud skills out and see where they fall. So for me, cloud culture is really important. And I like to make sure to give the job descriptions kind of after we figured out what people do so that you can cater to the existing staff that you have. I didn't want staff feeling displaced. I didn't want to bring in somebody um, as a cloud engineer without giving the internal folks a chance to really grow their own skills. That doesn't seem fair. So cloud culture is a big part of this. And then this is my last slide. So common mistakes. Uh, this is just the stuff that maybe I've done. Maybe I've seen other people do. I, I won't confess or deny anything. Um, the idea that people think they're going to have this great big plan and, and that no cloud adoption has happened yet and everybody's going to wait for this big plan to start um, is not realistic. Uh, even with GCP, you can easily start spinning up cloud workloads. Um, you have faculty, you have students, you have staff, it's already there. Um, so the goes back to the standards, the sooner you can put standards in place, the better. Um, really, that will help you scale well. Um, encouraging unrestricted exploration for all. So I, I have seen an environment where it was encouraged um, just to go out, build, play, do whatever you want, uh, which is an approach. Um, however, you have to be a little bit careful because that turned into having production workloads that looked very different from one another with completely different people doing the same thing. So it, it was, it's been really hard to sort of bring back to um, standards again. Multi-cloud is really hard. You have to decide if you're going to go multi-cloud from the beginning. 
Uh, if you're able to go with one cloud provider you, will, provider, you will be able to leverage a lot of those cloud native services more easily. If you go multi-cloud and you really expect to be able to pick up and easily transport your workloads, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time building out those services essentially on your own through other tools. So that's something to make sure you have talked about and figured out what works for your environment. Um, it, rigid upfront planning, the cloud, everything changes all the time. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, and you can have a high level plan, but you need to be prepared to pivot because that's reality. Uh, a lot of folks decide they're just going to move their data center to the cloud. I, you know, this, this can be an okay idea, um, but you really need to take an opportunity, take the opportunity to see if you can leverage any of those cloud services instead. So one of the simple ones that people use is RDS, right? And, and you know, this term lift and shift has kind of a bad connotation in my head because it makes it sound like you're doing that exactly and you're only moving um, your, your data center to the cloud. I think there's a lot of optimizations and services that you can use to make your workloads more efficient. Um, but you definitely have to contain the number of those that you're going to do if you have a set time frame, because you cannot do every optimization as you're migrating. That's pretty hard to do. Um, if you, you know, we we looked at three different strategies here: the managed service provider, professional services, and doing it yourself in a self-managed way. You, you need to be realistic with what your team can do. I have crazy smart people that I get to work with. I love working with them. They are busy already. I cannot say, let's go get out of San Diego on your own and keep doing all the work you're doing too. That's, that's not a fair expectation. So I need to really be thinking about what strategy makes sense for our migrations, given where we're at right now, not, not where I wish we were. I wish we had all the capacity in the world to do everything cloud right now and, and there was no operational work. And some of them probably do too, um, but realistically, we still have to support what we've got running. So we need to be really careful there. Um, unfortunately, I have not ever been able to find one migration strategy that works for everything. I really uh, would have hoped to find that by now, but I think the earlier slides show you that you just really have to think about those different factors and dimensions when you're trying to decide what strategy works best for you. Uh, one thing that I, I do and, and I shouldn't do is often I'm like, this is just infrastructure, don't worry about it. Uh, sometimes that's misleading, so I need to be careful with that myself. Um, any workload migration is going to require either application folks or business folks to do some form of validation. Now, the, their involvement could, could be a little bit fluctuating depending on what your culture is like. Um, often, we try to take most of the weight of the cloud migration ourselves and have the application team uh, do the testing to make sure things are working, but they definitely have expertise that we don't have and we always find things that need to be changed, so it has to be a partnership. Um, and it also has pretty significant financial implications. So you have to be careful to have that conversation uh, with your finance group about what going from CapEx to OpEx is like. You have to have that conversation with your security team about, you know, is are you ready? Do you have good security standards in place? Um, making sure that you don't just pretend it's an infrastructure only uh, effort, which I have fallen into sometimes. Um, migrating workloads when possible. So this is what I found when I went to UCOP. So we were all excited. We migrated path and I thought, I was kind of new. I was like, great, we're going to focus on me and cloud all the time, forever. And that's not realistic at all. There are so many other priorities, no matter where you are. And so it kind of, cloud kind of became like a, when we can do it, we'll move something over to AWS. And that wasn't working. Uh, that's why I had to find the Berkeley data center refresh as an opportunity because it was something that we didn't need a lot of outside resources for. We really didn't need any outside resources for and the impact to the application teams was pretty small. But the idea that you'll just move things when you can, um, you might have some success doing that on some workloads, but you won't be able to do all of your workloads that way. There will always be another priority that's more important and, it, and that's fine, but you've got to make cloud a, a priority at some point um, where you'll really struggle. Um, I have seen us, myself included, over and over forget about kind of operationalizing the cloud services, like we'll migrate, we'll migrate some big workload, and then um, we'll be like, yay, we're done, and we're celebrating, and we're all excited, and then we're like, oh, how are we going to handle the monitoring of that? We should have thought that through more. So you really have to think about, like, take some time, focus on that service transition, I till you know, dimension and make sure that you're thinking about how this is going to be operationally. How are you going to do patching? 
You need to talk that through. You need to have an incident response exercise with your security team in case there's something that happens in the cloud. You need to go through those pieces. And then one other common mistake that I have fallen to myself as well is around you, know, you bring in some vendors and they have their preferred tools and maybe you're, you know, you have some preferred tools, but then often the vendors tools, they already have solutions baked in. So sometimes they're driving what tools you're choosing. You gotta be really careful with that because they can make a decision that you then either have to redo later if it doesn't hit your cloud standard um, or you have to live with and then people have to be balancing like cloud formation and Terraform, and that's pretty tough. So those are some of the, the common mistakes that I, I have seen. Um, many of them, probably all of them, I've done myself, uh, but definitely things to consider uh, when you're going to the cloud. That is it for me, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Carrie, that was great. It was um, really, a, you covered a lot of ground very succinctly and the questions have been pouring in um, so let's, since we have about 15 minutes for discussion questions, um, let's see, let me, let me go. I actually had asked the first question. So since I'm talking, I'll do that one. Uh, are there any places where you intentionally do not make standards versus other areas where the standards are absolutely required? Um, or do you think that there should be a standard way of pretty much handling everything? Yeah, I mean, it's not realistic to have standards for everything. I mean, that sounds amazing though, Bill, right? Could you imagine a world where everything was perfectly defined? But that's not the cloud, right? It changes all the time. Um, there's some decisions you can't change once they're made. Account structure is one of them. It doesn't sound very important, but it is. If you if you need to redo account structure, that, that can be pretty tough to manage. Um, one area that I have let be pretty relaxed right now is around the IAM roles. Uh, which is not the best decision, but for our culture, given we had a lot of people doing different, um, they had different responsibilities in the cloud, we couldn't really enforce some strict IAM roles. So now we're getting to maturity where that will be a focus for us. Probably in the next three to six months, we'll have some solid cloud roles and IAM policies defined. Um, so that's when you can probably wait on. You have to look at your culture though. But yeah, it's not realistic to say everything's going to be perfect. Like backups, we definitely kind of, changed a little bit on how we handle backups. It's just that debt. Every time you change something, you have to go back and really retroactively repair whatever you change. So you just got to make sure to consider that in the decision. Is it enough of a value add to change your backup strategy? Maybe it is. Maybe you don't get enough of a win to go retroactively fix all those workloads. Great. Thank you. And then Robert, do you want to pop up on video and ask your question? Yeah, I was going to say mine's pretty pretty selfish and Berkeley data center related, like I promised you, Carrie. Uh, basically, you guys talked about migrate, or you talked about getting out of there. Is the hardware gone? I mean, the only reason I'm asking is because we're doing this whole data center migration, trying to reduce the power and stuff. So I was just curious if your actual hardware is out of the data center. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we we got we sent some folks out there. You guys were great, very helpful for us getting out of the data center, um, and we yeah. It's all, it's all been removed. I think it got removed about March. Um, okay. So if there's anything you find there that is ours, let me know, because I think we're all done. Thank you. Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, Saleh, do you want to pop up and ask your question? Saleh? All right, I'll do it. Um, Carrie, what do you think the... Uh, what do you think the most important as well as difficult, in your opinion, optimization that needs to be done is? I don't think it's difficult, but getting to downsize servers based on actual usage is not technically hard. It requires a lot of sign-off and, and business support. Um, so. I think that as far as it's not technically difficult, but like politically, it's pretty difficult to convince somebody that they don't need as much capacity that they might've had on premise, right? So we can now prove with data that your workloads are very light these many months of the year. So let's shrink it down to what we actually need. That, that can be hard to convince people because they've been living with a set, uh, a set capacity for so long. So I think that's, that's hard to get that optimization in place, but it's really the most cost important one as well. 
And then the floor is open if anyone wants to jump in and ask Carrie a question. This isn't a question, but it was just great to hear. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Hey, Carrie, this is Alex Lotz with AWS. Um, I just wanted to comment that it was it was really great to hear about all of the operational excellence that you've rolled out as part of your your cloud strategy. Um, you know, it was very well defined and kind of covered a a wide array of topics. So it's always great to see that. I really hope out of things like this, we all, I mean, we're all in education. We're all, most of us are the UCs, right? So we just want to help each other to, to have us all struggle over and over isn't effective, right? So the more we can share and learn from each other, the better. That's what this whole sector is about, is making sure you're contributing to each other and, and we can do the most with what we have. I'm definitely hoping that we can build on that. Um, in, in fact, for the group, I mean, one of the things that Carrie and I talked about probably a few months ago was, why should we have to reinvent so much stuff at all of our campuses that's basically sort of foundational? And um, just thinking about the way we could sort of share both artifacts and processes, but also maybe even foundational infrastructure as code and things like that. I mean, that will bring its own challenges, and then we'll have to do a presentation on that, but that is my, my hope. Um, you know, even just getting us all to use the same tools or similar tools is helpful, right? Like, to be honest, I, I uh, worked with the team, and we, we did Cloud Custodian at Santa Cruz, and then when I came to OP, we didn't have anything like that, and I'm like, great, we're going to do Cloud Custodian, and Santa Cruz uh, engineers were fantastic and kind of taught us what we needed to know. The engineers at OP were amazing and contributed back, and you know, so it's if we can just align on the tools, then we can become more efficient too. Even if I mean, I share the dream. So trust me, I share the dream of us all just having like, you know, giant scripts. But at a minimum, sharing the tools helps us so we have expertise that we can leverage with each other. And so Robert is the lead of our cloud team here. So I don't want to ask all the, the questions that he might be thinking. So I know I could pick up the vibrations coming out of your square there. I'm sure that. You have a question for Carrie that I was sort of, we sort of were hovering around some to do with standards. And I mean, if we're thinking of how to build the cloud service here, what, any thoughts, Robert? Yeah, you got, we, do we have enough time? Um, no, uh, one, quick, one quick question, Carrie, is do you guys um, utilize any third party like security tools or are you just using the on, you know, um, control tower security tools and guard duty and security hub? Yeah, I mean, we have QRadar as our SIM, but that's not cloud specific. Um, beyond that, we don't right now have any third party security tools that I can think of. Um, we are currently going through what we're calling an IS3 review um, to make sure that our cloud team is comfortable with what we have and identifying any critical items. So there might be something that comes out of that that is a gap, um, but we, we don't have any that I can think of right now that we purchase specifically for cloud. We have a lot of tools that we use for security, but they are both on-premise and cloud. Okay, thank you. And then one more, I'll just do one last one. Um, uh, more related around like uh, your standardizing and, and, and the enforcement of it. Is it something that's like, from top down, all customers underneath your guys' you know, purview follow these rules and how do you, I know you said cloud custodian enforces them from a technical standpoint, but how do you enforce them from a culture standpoint and get people to follow along with the, the yeah. standards? That's a good question. Um, you know, for me, when we vetted out the account owner responsibilities, we made it clear that, you know, being in our, what we consider like our managed cloud environment meant that there were certain things that they needed to do and certain things that we would just kind of, it wasn't a contract by any, by any means, but kind of an agreement. And as part of that, there were actions that they needed to take. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean it's their priority. Those monthly meetings help us. Um, but it was kind of like the rules of engagement. Like if you want us to, you want us to be moving to the cloud and you want to be part of that, then we've got to make sure that we all agree on how we're going to handle that. And often we can point to security risks or cost inefficiencies that help people understand the importance of those. We don't have standards just for fun. Usually there's a reason or a pain point that came out and we decided we need the standard on it. That's also happened. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> Always. 
hear you, you know, have this wide view on all of this stuff uh, makes our hearts feel good after all we've been through. <laughs> but uh, um, I, it's more of a comment about uh, the milieu that we're in on our campus, and I'm sure it's probably true at, at, at OP as well. And that is that a lot of the things that, that, that you need to take into account when you're moving something to the cloud are, you know, for the on-prem stuff in four or five different departments. Mm -hmm. and, the, and it's not just executive leadership. It's like you have to find the leadership in the weeds too and, they, and, and get them all on the same page. So um, yeah, I mean, that culture thing is like, it, it's, there are wheels within wheels and leadership within leadership. <laughs> and that's what we learned. Um, you know, the, the IAM and network and operations you know, and all of the application owners. It was, yeah, it was a bit. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Terry for um, attending this. And it was actually interesting for me to hear about the culture as well. I think like Russ, um, I experienced a little bit of that. And I actually wanted to tell you that, you know, I'm so glad that I saw presentation because when I was in Seattle, this was the presentation that I missed and I was trying to find the recording. So when Bill Allison said that you were coming to speak, I was very excited. So um, thank you for presenting. Thank you for letting us know about your cloud journey. And um, I was kind of, my ears went up when I looked at the culture slide because I think that is very important. That's a part of, a very important part of going to the, the journey. Yeah, thank you so much. And and that the culture piece, I think the point I was trying to make, I think the culture has to be built upwards too. So having the business problems, not enough. You'd think that logic would prevail, but there is also, um, there's a cultural aspect of winning over hearts and minds about a major change in direction. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that's part of our journey that we're on right now. So anyway, thank you. This is super useful. And uh, I don't know exactly yet what the topic is next month, but we will be getting out to you all soon with an announcement about that. So thank you, Carrie, and we will see you all next month. Okay.